I've got a nice little problem for you guys today. So our goal is to find out how many real numbers x satisfy the following radical equation. So we've got the seventh root of x minus the fifth root of x equals the cube root of x minus the square root of x. And before we get started really solving this, I wanna make the following observation. And that is that there are a couple of like very, very obvious solutions to this and those are x equals zero and x equals one. Notice if we plug in x equals zero, we have zero minus zero on the left-hand side, zero minus zero on the right-hand side. If we plug in x equals one, we've got one minus one on the left-hand side and one minus one on the right-hand side. So those are both solutions. So let's maybe note that. So x equals zero and x equal one are solutions. So really our goal is to find out if there are any other solutions and how many other solutions are there. And the way that we would like to do that is to transform this into some sort of polynomial equation that will save these two solutions, x equals zero and x equals one, and also allow us to like factor those solutions out. So let's look at this and see what kind of like maybe change of variables we could do in order to change this into a polynomial equation. So what we would like to do is set x equal to something, maybe equal to some monomial, so that the square root, the cube root, the fifth root, and the seventh root are all non-radical objects. So let's maybe see how we could do that most easily. So let's look at the least common multiple of seven, five, three, and two. But notice that those are relatively prime, so the least common multiple is in fact just their product. But if you look at their product, you get 210. So really we could set x equal to some new variable to any common multiple of seven, three, five, and two, but we might as well take the least common multiple because that's the easiest, and that will transform this equation with radicals to a polynomial equation. So let's do that exactly. So let's set x equal to t to the 210, and let's see what that does to our old equation. So now we'll have the seventh root of t to the 210, minus the fifth root of t to the 210 equals the cube root of t to the 210 minus the square root of t to the 210. But now we can just use standard rules about exponents and roots in order to change this to t to the 210 over seven and then so on and so forth. So let's see what that changes this into. So we'll have t to the 30 here. This is t to the 210 divided by five, but that's gonna be t to the 42. Great, and then let's see, on this side of the equation, we'll have t to the 70, and then here we'll have t to the 105, like that. So that changed our radical equation into an equation that is just with polynomials. And also what we wanna notice is that our solutions over here can only be non-negative values of x. So that means we're really only looking for non-negative values of t here. So here we want solutions where t is bigger than or equal to zero. So just as before, like t equals zero and t equals one correspond to x equals zero and x equals one, so those are solutions. But like I said, we somehow wanna factor those out. But now we can move this around so it looks like we're finding the roots of a polynomial and put it in decreasing order of exponents. So let's see, we'll have t to the 105 minus t to the 70. That's what we get from moving both things on the right-hand side to the left-hand side. Then we'll have minus t to the 42 plus t to the 30 equals zero. Now we have a greatest common factor. We can factor that out. That's gonna be t to the 30. So that's gonna leave us with t to the 75 minus t to the 40 minus t to the 12 plus one equals zero. Okay, great. Then another thing that we would like to do is factor out the root that corresponds to t equals one or x equals one because we know that's a solution as well. So let's see how we can do that. So we can do that in the following tricky way. 
So we'll have t to the 30 times t minus 1 times the quantity t to the 75 minus t to the 40 all over t minus 1. And then uh, minus t to the 12 minus 1 all over t minus 1. Where again here we're subtracting that whole fraction. So this minus sign distributes through to the minus 1 to give us this plus 1 up here. So notice if we multiply this t minus 1 through, both of these t minus 1s in the denominator will cancel. And that'll mean that what's left in the middle will probably not have a root of 1 unless we've got a multiple root of t equals 1 there. Okay, so let's maybe move this to the top and then we'll finish it off. So on the last board, we argued through a change of variables with x equals t to the 210 that transformed our goal equation into the following new equation. Now we're going to go ahead and simplify this a little bit, and we're going to do that by recalling this nice rule involving quotients of polynomials, or if you look at it from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, the sum of a finite geometric series. So we have t to the m minus 1 divided by t minus 1 equals t to the m minus 1 plus t to the m minus 2 all the way down to t plus 1. Now we want to apply this division rule on this first term here and this second term here. But maybe in order to nicely apply it to this first term, let's go ahead and notice that we can divide out a t to the 40 here. That's going to leave us with t to the 40, and then we'll have t to the 35 minus 1, like that. So let's see what that gives us. So now we've got t to the 30 times t minus 1. And then in our big yellow parentheses, we'll be left with t to the 40. And then we'll have t to the 34 plus all the way down to 1, where I've got every power of t in between. And then next we've got this is minus t to the 11 plus all the way down to 1, where I've got every power of t in between. And now what I want to notice is that my roots t equals 0 and t equals 1 are coming from this part right here. So notice if t equals 0 and t equals 1, these are the roots which are hopefully all factored out. So now I'm going to give this guy a name. So maybe we'll give this guy in the yellow parentheses the name f of t. So I'm going to do a quick inequality involving f of t. And then after that, we're going to finish it off by checking everywhere else that the inequality hasn't helped us with. So let's notice we have the following. So if t is bigger than 1, well, I want to notice then in that case, t to the m is bigger than t to the n if m is bigger than n. But then that's the same thing as saying that t to the m minus t to the n is bigger than 0. Here I'm like adding 34 terms there, I'm subtracting 11 terms. So I can do some sort of pairing using this inequality in order to show that this thing is always positive. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. So we've got f of t equals, so I'm gonna take the first bunch of terms here. So let's see, we'll have t to the 74 plus t to the 73 all the way down to well, let's see, where do we need to stop? Probably at t to the 52, because if we stop at t to the 52, that leaves us with 11 more terms that we can group with these 11 terms. So in other words, what we have left over is t to the 51 minus t to the 11 plus t to the 50 minus t to the 10 plus all the way down to t to the 40 minus 1. But now what we can do is notice that if t is bigger than 1, well, that's going to make this thing bigger than 0, this thing bigger than 0, this thing bigger than 0. But then all of these things are bigger than 1, making this whole thing bigger than 0. So what that tells us is that there are no roots when t is bigger than 1. So let's see what we've got. We've got a root at t equals 0, a root at t equals 1, no roots when t is bigger than 1. 
let's see if there's a possibility for a root between t equals zero and t equals one. So let's maybe do that by noticing the following, f of zero is equal to, so notice this first term is zero because of the t to the 40 factor, and this last term is gonna be one because we've got that constant term. So that means f of zero equals one. Now next we can see that f of one equals, well let's see, this is gonna add up to 35, and then this is gonna be add, add up to 12. So we have 35 minus 12 is equal to 23. So here at zero, the function is negative. At one, the function is positive. So what that tells us is that there exists a root, we'll call it t0 on the interval zero to one, such that f of t0 equals zero. And that's by the intermediate value theorem. Okay, good. So now let's maybe go ahead and clean this up and then we'll argue why we don't have any other roots on the interval zero to one. Let's see where we are. So we've got two obvious solutions to this equation at x equals zero and x equals one. Then using an accessory function and the intermediate value theorem, we showed that there must be a third root, which now we'll call it x naught on the interval zero to one not including zero and not including one. And that corresponded to x naught equals t naught to the 210, where the t naught came into existence by the intermediate value theorem, like we said before. Next, there are no roots for x bigger than one. We showed that by an inequality. Now we're ready to finish it off. So this was our accessory equation, which we showed had roots at zero, one, and this point between zero and one. Now what we want to do is maybe divide this by t to the 30, and what we'll do is define a new function. I'll call this g of t, which is t to the 75 minus t to the 40 minus t to the 12 plus one. And what we see immediately is that this has roots at t equals one and some t naught between zero and one. And it might have roots other places. Well, it won't have roots when t is bigger than one, but it have, might have more roots on the interval zero to one. And we wanna show that that is impossible. But now we'll use Descartes' rule of signs, which says that the number of roots of a polynomial is bounded above by the number of times the signs of the coefficients change. So notice that this has two roots that are positive and the sign changes twice. So it changes from positive to negative here and then back to positive here. So that means that this has at most two positive roots. And so just to reiterate, that's by Descartes' rule of signs. So let's see, we've got two roots for this we found. There are at most two roots, so that means we have all of the roots. Combine this with this t to the 30, that gives us this root t to the zero, so that means we indeed have all of the roots over here. There are exactly three, and that's a good place to stop.